Uh, good afternoon, friends. So, let's have, uh, let's get started with our afternoon session. So, going to be a difficult session. Shan is going to have a tough time in uh, keeping you all of you alive. <laughs> so, now we are going to talk about the the new power programs, development of nuclear power programs particularly focused on newcomer countries or, or other places as well. So, Sean is an expert in, uh, in uh, helping countries to develop nuclear power programs. He comes from the nuclear uh, infrastructure development section. So, make use of the time available uh, and then ask as many questions as possible with him and then uh, interact and get maximum out of this session. All right, Thank thanks, you, Ashok. Yeah, and I see presenting after lunch is not necessarily a challenge, but an opportunity. So here we go. Um, as Ashok mentioned, I'm coming from the nuclear infrastructure development section. And I know that name sounds a little bit broad. Um, when you think nuclear infrastructure, I don't know, what is it that you think of? Anyone? I'm trying to keep you on your toes also. <laughs> I heard something. People, what? Yeah. Um, I would say if you think about I think that's a perfect description of the work that our section does. Yeah, we are really focused on nuclear power. Even though we're called Nuclear Infrastructure Development Section, we don't look at things like the regulatory support for sources, even if some countries might think that's part of their nuclear infrastructure. Um, so we're a relatively new section at the agency. We were formed in 2007. And we were really formed at the demand of member states who are considering nuclear power. Some of the more vocal ones in the board were countries like the UAE and Egypt. Um, and this was at a time where there was this idea of the nuclear renaissance, and it seemed like uh, you know, a lot of growth was projected in nuclear power. It seemed like a lot of countries were considering adding. And the agency was providing support to countries, except it was spread among all these different departments. It's like, well, we need help from legal. That comes from the Office of Legal Affairs. We need help setting up the regulatory body. That comes from the regulatory affairs section. We need help with our siting, and that comes from the siting and external events section. And we need help with energy planning, and that comes from the energy planning section. So what member states really wanted was a single point of contact to say, you guys get organized, and you help us with a coordinated program of assistance. So that's really where we see our role. Um, so here's the outline of my presentation. I'm going to start just by talking a little bit about the status of nuclear power in the world and the projections for growth. Then we're going to talk about why some of the countries who are embarking and seriously considering embarking on nuclear power are doing so. What are some of the reasons that they think it's important for their energy mix? Then sort of the bulk of my presentation is going to be this introduction to the IAEA approach, which we call the milestones approach. Um, this is based on this sort of document, which I'll talk a little bit more in detail, milestones in the development of a national infrastructure for nuclear power. It's sort of a two-dimensional document. It looks across time and the development of the program, and then it looks deep at a layered set of issues. Um, one of the important parts of this approach is the idea of evaluation, because infrastructure encompasses a lot of different things. It's really important for countries to have a way to look at their infrastructure, grade it across a set of benchmarks, identify what the gaps are, so that they can focus their efforts in those areas and be ready either to take a decision or to sign a contract or to move to a next phase of the program. Um, stemming from that, once you understand how we help identify gaps in countries' infrastructure, I'll talk about some of the ways the IAEA provides assistance to help those countries fill those gaps, and then some conclusions. So this is a cool graph. It didn't come from our section. It came from Maliki's section, actually. And this is the year of first nuclear power plant commissioning by country. And the blue dots are in the past, and the pink dots are in the future. So each dot represents a different country. So you can see, looking kind of here to the mid-1950s, that was when you had the very first commercial nuclear power plants in the Soviet Union, the United States, the UK, 
And then a number of countries sort of continued that trend in the 50s, 60s, 70s, even 80s. You see, there's almost about one new country every year for several decades. Then here, kind of after Three Mile Island, after Chernobyl, you sort of see it tail out a bit. And you have you know, this big gap of almost 15 years here between blue dots. Um, incidentally, can, do any of you know which some of these last joiners are? Like this last country to commission their first nuclear power plant it was in 2011, as a hint. I heard United Arab Emirates. What I would say is that they're probably this first pink dot. They actually haven't commissioned yet. They were scheduled to commission Unit 1 this year. Now it's, they're talking about commissioning Unit 1 next year. So I think this is in 2017, but probably should be 2018. This other dot here is probably going to be any other guesses? The next pink one after UAE. Who else is constructing close to completion? Uh, Belarus is correct. China has several operating nuclear power plants already. So China is one of these blue dots here. They're not the last one. I think they're this one here. 1991 maybe was their first. Anyone know 2011? Countries in the room, I think somebody. Turkey is another one of these pink ones. All right, I'll give it away. It's Iran, 20, 2011. They started conducting the Bushir plant uh, decades before, but it was commissioned for the first time in 2011, so that's their first nuclear power plant. Uh, some of the other ones, China, Romania, I think, maybe Czech Republic, I'm not sure, some of these last ones in the, in the 80s. So I suppose I should get to the point of including this slide, which is that even though we sort of saw this big tail off, you see these pink dots. There's a lot of countries who are still interested in nuclear power even after Fukushima. So the IAEA is working with all these countries um, and trying to help them prepare and be successful. So here's kind of more detail about the newcomers. Um, I'll describe a little bit how we divide the milestones approach into different phases. But um, I included several years so you can sort of see the trends. This is current, 2017. And we have phase three sort of split into two parts, but we have five countries in phase three, which are the closest to, uh, to commissioning and operating their first NPP. We mentioned these two here with the, the plan already under construction are the UAE and Belarus. Several countries have ordered the first nuclear power plant, but haven't poured the first safety concrete yet, but it's coming soon. Um, there's four countries we estimate that have decided to introduce nuclear power and are really active in preparing the infrastructure, developing the regulatory body, doing a number of things, which I'll also describe. And then in phase one, which is, uh, let's say, a phase of consideration, or maybe they have a decision maker in the country who said, yes, we're going, but now they're you know, doing all the, let's say, pre-feasibility studies and preparing uh, for a national commitment that's going to be on the order of 100 years. We think there's about 19 countries there. So in all, about 28 newcomers, and it's been relatively steady, uh, even despite Fukushima. Anyone else can guess what these three countries are? I heard one person guessed it when we were guessing about Iran. But Turkey. Turkey is one, yeah. Turkey has a contract. So not yet. Hmm. South Africa has operating nuclear power plants. They're an interesting case. They've had the Kuburg nuclear power since early 80s, but they are considering new builds. So actually, they're following some of the guidance in the milestones approach, and they had a review mission. Um, let's say in this box, Turkey is one. Bangladesh has contracted, has the financing arrangement in place, and plans to pour its first concrete later this year. Um, the other one, which you can see we had two, two. We just added one to this group the last time the, the interagency committee considered, and that's Egypt, because a lot of the contracts are final. Um, I think they haven't announced yet, but it'll, it'll happen soon. So. This is... <laughs> so... <laughs> Sorry, is this news to the Egyptians in the room? <laughs> Maybe I need to fix my information. I'm not sure. But <laughs> we can talk. Um, so 
Here's like the, uh, let's say the million dollar question or maybe even the multi-billion dollar question. Why nuclear power? And I think to answer that question, we need to sort of step back and say first, why, why energy, why electricity? And I really like this map. It was taken in 2000 and you can really see a stark difference between the developed areas of the world and the developing areas of the world. And that's because energy and electricity are really essential for every aspect of development. The UN um, established or adopted these sustainable development goals in 2015 to replace the Millennium Development Goals. And one of the big changes was that clean, affordable energy for all was included as part of the SDGs because there was this growing recognition that when you're talking about raising living standards or improving health care or improving agriculture or uh, developing your industry, uh, you need to have a secure, stable source of electricity. And a lot of countries uh, are hungry for this. So what we uh, project is an increase in electricity use worldwide from between 65 to 100 percent in some projections just by 2030. And almost all this growth will occur in the developing world. So what we hope is that the next time the satellites take these pictures, we'll see a lot more of the world lit up. Oops, I skipped over a slide. So that sort of answers the question, why, why energy or why electricity? But then the next question is, well, why nuclear relative to the other choices that are out there, whether it's gas or coal or renewables, wind, solar, hydro, geothermal? Why nuclear? And these are some of the reasons that countries are telling us they want to pursue nuclear power. Um, countries are concerned about energy security. They're looking for diversity in their energy mix. They don't want to rely on one or maybe two types of imported fuel. Um, they want access to affordable and predictable energy services. Um, in some cases, the prices of, renew of uh, fossil fuels can fluctuate a lot. So when a country thinks it has energy security, prices change. All of a sudden, it doesn't feel so secure. Um, reliability of electricity supply for countries that pursue a renewable heavy approach. Um, you can have problems because the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. So you need um, electricity supply that can run sort of on a baseload basis and power industry. Um, and countries, even developing countries, I think, have a keen sense of concern about the environment. Some because they have uh, some fossil plants and a lot of air pollution and they're dealing with that. And some countries are even concerned about climate change. So they're looking for low carbon energy supply options. So, these are some of the reasons countries are going for nuclear power. Um, and again, it sort of harks back to what Aliki was talking about yesterday. Energy planning is really a key component of deciding on nuclear power and committing to a program. So like I said, this is sort of the basis for what we call the milestones approach to introducing nuclear power. I'm going to pass the book around just so you can kind of take a look and see how it's organized. Um, but this book uh, is intended sort of as the, they call it the, well, they started to call it, it's our Bible, but then we started to realize that wasn't a very inclusive term. So now we're saying it's our holy book for infrastructure development. Um, and what we see is that almost all countries who are introducing nuclear power are considering it, are following this approach and using the common language and lexicon that it establishes. And we're seeing vendors and industry adopt it as well. Um, it first came out in 2007 when our section was initiated. Um, it was put together by gathering a lot of experts and talking about, well, if, you're, if you want to coordinate and structure the introduction of nuclear power, how would you do it? So it's based on 40 years of experience and best practices, and then was recently revised in 2015 because our section's done a lot of work with newcomer countries in the eight years between 2007 and 2015. We learned a lot of lessons. In some ways, we made things simpler. Um, so this Rev 1 is the newest version, and I'll pass it around for people to take a look. And what you'll see is that it sort of divides the process of introducing nuclear power into three different phases. Uh, the first phase is a consideration phase. The second phase is once there's a decision, sort of at a point in time, then the country prepares. Uh, then the, the third phase, I would say, Contracting isn't really a point in time, but a process. So I would say contracting and construction take place in phase three. And then the country is ready to commission the first nuclear power plant. Now, this is the chart. So this is sort of a simplified version, just so that you can get a sense of the, the time dimension. This is how it looks in the detailed form in the guidance document. 
And I think a couple important things to point out is the first, we don't consider a country in phase one until nuclear power is specifically included as an option in the country's national energy strategy. That's sort of our prerequisite to say you're really serious about considering nuclear power. Phase one is described as considerations before a decision to launch a nuclear power program is taken. Um, and milestone one has been rephrased a little bit in the revised guidance. It used to be ready to make a knowledgeable decision. Now we, we call it ready to make a knowledgeable commitment to a nuclear power program. Because a number of countries said, well, we already took the decision back here. Here was just figuring out just how feasible it was. And then now milestone one is about making the commitment. Um, so phase two, like I mentioned, is a serious phase for infrastructure development. Um, it's a lot of preparatory work. You're building institutions. You're developing the key organizations that are going to implement and oversee the program. And you're preparing to take a decision to enter into a, a big multi-billion dollar contract in most cases. Um, so the milestone at the end of phase two is that you're ready to invite bids, or if you're working with a strategic partner or a sole supplier, negotiate the contract for the first nuclear power plant. And then phase three, like I said, is once you're ready to contract, you, you contract at the beginning of phase three, you reach a final investment decision, and then you begin constructing. And at milestone three, you should be ready to commission and operate the first nuclear power plant safely and sustainably. So these are sort of the, the milestones that we use to, to measure where a country is at the end of each phase. And here are the things that we're measuring. 19 different infrastructure issues. And when we say infrastructure, some people hear that word and they think instantly to the hard physical things like the electrical grid or the readiness of the site itself. Um, but when we say infrastructure, we're looking at it in a comprehensive way. And a lot of these issues are so-called soft issues. You see things like nuclear safety, nuclear security, nuclear safeguards, um, a regulatory framework. There's a number of cross-cutting issues like human resource development, um, stakeholder involvement, which you heard just in relation to the back end this morning, um, emergency planning, and then a number of things that relate to policies, whether it's national position, your industrial involvement policy, uh, your policy for radioactive waste management. Um, but the idea is that based on international best practices and experience, the idea was these are the 19 things that matter. And if you really want to maximize your program's chances of succeeding, you need to focus on all these issues. You need to take them into account at each of the major inflection points. So at the end of phase one, here's where oh, I'm still getting these buttons. At the end of phase one, here's where you decide to implement. And phase two is going to come mostly from funding from the government, and it's going to cost on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. So it's a big this, it's a big commitment. It's a big investment to say we're going to spend all this money building a regulator and um, start starting to put emergency preparedness options in place. Um, Prepare, doing a lot of detailed site characterization, uh, thing, things that are expensive that, you know, at the end of this phase, you may not ever be ready or you might decide against nuclear power and the government won't get that money back. Um, so it's a, it's a big commitment at milestone one, and it's another big commitment at milestone two, because that's when you're going to, you know, essentially be ready to enter into a multi-billion dollar contract. And then at milestone three, this is another sort of point of no return. Once you start irradiating material, you can't just walk away from the plant. There's, there's things you need to do to ensure safety. Um, and at that point, your you know, decommissioning becomes a lot harder once the plant has been active. Okay. So um, I want to throw some numbers at you because countries come, you know, they look at these documents, they look through, they say, oh, this is so detailed, this is so much work, do we really have to do all this work? Why do we have to do this? Is this binding? We say, no, it's not binding. It's not like your safeguards agreement. It's a legally binding document with obligations. It's not like the IAEA safety standards. This is really just guidance. Um, but it comes from somewhere. And sorry, I need to update this number. It should be 447. But can anyone guess what this number is? <laughs> I think I've heard it from several areas of the room, but yes, it's the number of currently operating nuclear power reactors. 
and it is 447, my next number also has to be adjusted. It should be 58, not 59, because one, one plant went from this number to this number. But what's 59? Yeah, power reactors under construction. And sorry, I put these slides together a couple weeks ago before I went on travel and on vacation. And uh, in that time, Fuching 4 in China moved from under construction to commission. So sorry, it's like, it's like three weeks old. But now, some other numbers, maybe a little more challenging. 33. And it's not a count of reactors. I think there's more than 33 research reactors. Um, countries who are planning or considering, we count about 28, but that's kind of soft. This is a hard number that nobody can dispute. Yeah. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Amparo is shaking her head. This is the number of countries, and this is the number of countries that have ever operated a nuclear power plant. And I think in one of Amparo's presentation, there were 30 countries that are currently operating. There's also three other countries who have operated in the past and are not operating now. So one more number, a big one that's not like the others. 17,241 plus growing all the time. Yeah, nailed it right here. <laughs> Operational years of nuclear power reactors. So it's a lot. And the point of this slide is to show you that the milestones approach wasn't invented out of whole cloth. They got together people from all these 33 countries. You can see in the back the list of people who participated in the process of developing this guidance. It's really um, a great information exchange, identification of best practices, and trying to capture as much guidance as possible to maximize countries' chances for success. Um, if you talk to any of the operating countries, they'll all have experiences they can share where they said, oh, we totally screwed this up, or we did all these things right, but there's this one thing we didn't do right, and it set our whole program back five years, and it was really costly. So the idea is that if you take care of all these 19 issues in the phased approach, um, you're going to maximize your chances for success, learn from the mistakes of others, uh, and hopefully be successful. So self-evaluation. The next document I'm going to pass around is this IAEA Nuclear Energy Series NGT 3.2 Rev 1. The revision was just published at the very end of last year. Um, and it contains a methodology for assessing the status of your nuclear power infrastructure. So for each of those 19 issues, the conditions or what the agency expects or what you know, would, be, would maximize your chances of success at the end of phase one, at milestone one, are described there for each issue. Um, the self-evaluation is it's really essential. Um, it helps you assess the status as well as track the progress over time. I mean, introducing nuclear power is a process that takes 10 to 15 years, maybe more. Um, so it really helps to, to know where you are at a given time track that over time, uh, identify the gaps, and devote resources and effort to those areas. Um, so no matter how serious countries are, we highly recommend that you familiarize yourself with this document and that you begin to conduct self-evaluation, whether you want agency assistance or whether you want a review mission or not. Um, it's, it's great for countries to know this and know what they should be doing. Um, the other thing, then, is that the self-evaluation can be used as the basis for an international peer review mission, which we call INEAR. It stands for Integrated, meaning it covers all 19 issues, Nuclear Infrastructure Review Mission. So here are some examples. I'll pass it around. You can, you can take a look, but you'll see, like, if you just turn to a page, here's an issue, emergency planning. Here's sort of the, the condition we expect, summary of the condition, examples of how, the, how you can demonstrate the condition. Um, and this, let's see, this is just an example, but this is the issue of legal framework. It has several conditions. We only use one here as an example, but the condition is that adherence to all relevant international legal instruments is planned. Okay, Planned, this is to be done at the end of milestone one. And this is a very common thing for many of the infrastructure issues in phase one. The types of things that we're looking for are understanding, understanding what needs to be done over the course of the, the program, 
and having plans in place to do many of the things in phases two and phase three. There are very few issues where we actually expect um, deliverables in phase one. There are a few. Um, but for the most part, I would say that phase one is about understanding and planning. If you look at most of the conditions, that's what they relate to. Now, in this document, uh, the methodology for phase one is in orange. Once you get to phase two, it's the blue color. So same issue, legal framework. And the first condition this time is that the international legal instruments governing nuclear activities are adhered to. So you can see it's a difference in phase two versus phase one. Whereas phase one, we expect understanding and plans to adhere. In this period of preparation in phase two, that's when you actually should adhere so that by the, end, the time you're ready to contract, you have a robust legal framework that's in place to govern all the activities. So you can see the difference is phase two adhered to phase one planned. Now, because it's the Nuclear Energy Management School, one of the 19 issues is the issue of management. Um, this is sort of a catch-all thing, but I'll use this as another example. And instead of showing it in the format, I've spelled it out in bigger text so that you can see. So in, from management in milestone one, there's only one condition. And that's part of the revision. We used to have more. We went to countries. We realized it was too much to expect in phase one. It was too complicated. And we realized we could capture everything with one condition. And that's that the need for appropriate leadership in management systems is recognized. Again, it's not expected to have you know, a lot of detailed structures in place. In some cases, the key organizations won't even exist at the end of phase one. You might not have a regulatory body that's developed to oversee nuclear power. You may not have yet identified an owner-operator organization. Um, but really, we're looking for evidence that the, the importance of this is recognized. And then the basis for evaluation, uh, these are the specific things we would look at, a commitment to, to leadership and management systems to ensure success, promote culture for safety, security, and safeguards, and then plans to ensure that knowledge gained by the Nuclear Energy Program Implementing Organization, we could just say the government for short, is transferred to the future regulatory body and owner operator if they don't exist. Now, when we look to milestone two for management, we have three different conditions. Um, the first is that the contract specifications and evaluation criteria are determined. So you should have a bid invitation specification, and you should have the criteria established that say how you're going to evaluate the information you receive from different suppliers. Um, even if you have a sole supplier, you should have this bid invitation specification with your requirements completed. So again, that's a tangible thing that should exist by the end of phase two. Another thing is that your owner operator should be identified, established, and they should by now have competence for procuring and managing the NPP contract. Um, and what we're looking for is that the team is competent to verify the project progress and the quality requirements, as well as the procedures for knowledge management. Um, and then the final condition is that management systems have been established. Um, and these should be in the key organizations, whether it's the, you know, the government, the regulatory body, uh, and the owner operator. So those management systems should ensure that all legal requirements are met, safety, security, and safeguards. And there should be a mechanism to monitor infrastructure development. In other words, what you don't want is to have the owner operator charging ahead, ready to contract, but you don't have a regulatory body that's competent to oversee that process or to issue a license. So someone in government should be making sure that the regulatory body gets going, if that's the case in your country. Question? Why Any un have an idea? Okay. Well, you're the customer. You have legal requirements. It needs to cover things like how much fuel is going to be in the first load, how many, how much fuel are you going to keep on site, what are you going to do with your spent fuel, um, do they need to build spent fuel storage on your site? Um, does it meet your legal requirements? Does it meet your environmental requirements, obligations? Um, the, there's even cases where countries have the, um, the owner operator might be a foreign held company or a joint stock company that has largely people from the country of the supplier country. But still, there's a negotiation between that team and the supplier team. And 
the supplier team needs to know what the buying team is asking for. So you need a specifications document. I think it's not so different. And we have uh, a guidance document specifically on this and an online tool, which I, I have a link to also. But real, really, this is a lesson learned, is that it's, it's not such a different document, and it's an important exercise to go through. OK, so we talked a little bit about countries apply the evaluation methodology. They identify their gaps. Um, one of the most requested review services among the newcomer countries is this Integrated Nuclear Infrastructure Review Mission. Um, and this is sort of an independent way to check where you are. And countries like to do this typically like a year before they expect they're at one of the milestones. Because they have a good idea of where they are, but it's nice to have people from the agency. And the, the teams for these missions are a hybrid of, of agency staff from different sections. We usually have someone from the Office of Legal Affairs, the Department of Safeguards, the Department of Safety and Security, the Department of Fuel Cycle to look at issues like fuel cycle policy and radioactive waste management. Um, the Nuclear Energy Department, and then a number of external experts uh, from around the world. And the idea is that we sort of check the evaluation, and the team will make a number of recommendations and suggestions. Then the country will help tailor its action plan to, to make sure those gaps get filled so that it's ready to move to the next stage. Um, and it's also a good exercise because the, you know, introducing nuclear power requires a lot of different stakeholders throughout a country, many different government stakeholders, and going through a formal process like this is a good way to sort of align all the players, get people together and on the same page. We also have a tech doc, um, which is called Six Years of Lessons Learned from In-Ear Missions, and it shows which of the 19 issues in phase one and phase two most commonly get recommendations and suggestions what are those recommendations? So even countries just looking at that can get an idea of, well, hmm, maybe we should look carefully at ourselves and make sure that we're, we're in good shape on this issue, even if you're not at the point where you're ready to conduct a full self-evaluation or an in-ear mission. So this is a list of all the missions that have been conducted. The first one was in Jordan in 2009. The most recent one was in Ghana earlier this year. Um, and you can see there's been 22 different missions many of the newcomer countries. Um, so why do you think it's such a popular service? And why do you think we've conducted so many in so many of the newcomer countries? Any guesses? If you're in the country, why do you, what do you think would be the value of this, the report and the recommendations and suggestions that come out of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think it's right. It, it really helps the country. If you have skeptical public or skeptical stakeholders, maybe within your own government, and you say, oh, well, we've done a self-evaluation. We're in good shape. We're, we're really happy with it. We understand. Maybe that's not so convincing to some of your stakeholders. It does really help to have a, an independent review and to be able to say, look, you know, you're worried that we're not doing things safely while well, we're following the IAEA guidance. And here's sort of their findings related to all these different aspects. Um, the other thing is that this can actually help you in terms of attracting financing. Because uh, you're going to require some uh, balance of debt and equity financing. And debt financing is challenging to get. And the financiers are going to be looking for evidence that the risk to the program and construction risk is low. So if you can say, look, we're following international best practices, and the agency has very few recommendations, uh, that can help demonstrate that your program is less risky and that there's not a lot of showstoppers or things that haven't been taken care of um, that could make that a bad investment. So here's how the IAEA sort of takes the results of self-assessment, national action plans, and then independent peer review missions with recommendations and suggestions. And uh, uses that to help define an integrated program of assistance. So these are sort of things that we've talked about. Member state does self-evaluation, identifies its own gaps, has a national action plan, 
then maybe the country invites IAEA review missions. This could include the integrated review mission, the INEAR, but it can also include other more specific uh, issues that go deeper on specific uh, of the 19 issues. The IRS mission looks really in depth at issue seven, which is the regulatory framework. Um, EPREV is the emergency preparedness and response review mission, which looks in depth at issue 14. Um, seed mission can come multiple times throughout the program, and it's looking at the site survey, site study, site characterization, site siting process. Um, and then all those sort of uh, inputs go into something that we call a country nuclear infrastructure profile. I'll show the example here on the next page. Um, and basically, this provides a snapshot with some information of where the country is on all 19 issues. It's really easy to fill this once we've conducted an in-year mission, because it essentially you just plug in the results of the in-year mission. Um, but then the country will work over time. You'll have some workshops. You'll do some things internally. You'll start to fill some of the gaps. So each year, we like to sort of do a check. And uh, you know we sort of keep this in between formal review missions to have a, a current snapshot. Um, the gaps that are identified through all these documents uh, will be addressed through an integrated work plan. This is a big spreadsheet which looks at sources of funding support, whether through technical cooperation, national projects, regional projects, interregional projects. Um, in some cases, the country will share um, plans for bilateral assistance on certain areas. And we put it into a big spreadsheet and say, well, this year we're going to do for this issue, we're going to do an expert mission, we're going to review the policy once you finish revising it. Um, or we'll send people for a fellowship to this country to learn more about it. So we come up with a big package of assistance, and then that's reviewed annually. So that's how we try to do better now than we were doing in 2007 when we were uncoordinated. So I talked about the CNIP. I talked a little bit about the IWP just now. Um, Let's talk then about some of the main forms of IAEA assistance to newcomers. One key thing, uh, you saw, you've seen it probably in all the presentations so far, the agency does a lot of collecting of good practices, lessons learned, into guidance documents. Um, so just these, these documents I'm going to share are just for the issue of management. Uh, it's only one of the 19 issues. Um, as I described sort of some of the different uh, conditions in the evaluation methodology, you see there's sort of different aspects to management that are captured. One is the strength and readiness of the owner-operator organization. Another is the uh, management systems in the key organizations. And then the last is the, the whole project management, um, so making sure all the parts of the program are moving in concert. Um, so for the owner-operator, we have a key document that was published in 2009 but it's in the process of being revised, so revision one should be coming soon, and it's focused on responsibilities and capabilities of that organization. Um, there's some other documents which are relevant, um, preparation of a feasibility study. Um, as we'll talk in my next presentation, that's a key uh, activity in phase two and early phase three. Um, and then this one I mentioned before when we had the question from Sudan about invitation and evaluation of bids. We have this good guidance document here. And resources, I also mentioned in the question about bids, the IAEA Nuclear Contracting Toolkit. This used to be called Bid Eval. It helps the country ensure that it's uh, well prepared for its bid invitation, whether it's going for a tender process or for a sole supplier. Uh, related to management systems, the key document here is the IAEA Safety Standard GSR Part 2, Leadership and Management for Safety. This replaced the old GSR-3, and there's a much bigger focus on the, the issue of leadership now. And then there's a number of other relevant documents, management systems, application of management systems, development and implementation of a process-based management system. Um, you know, the safety standards are sort of high level, and then countries say, well, how do I do it in practice? So some of these lower level documents try to explain that and use specific examples. Um, then there's a number of documents that compare the IAEA safety standards to other internationally accepted standards like the ISO series um, and the NQA1. And then there's a couple of e-learning modules available on management systems. Last, NPP project management. 
There's a draft document which is already being distributed to member states if you ask the people who are working on it. Um, and then there's an additional relevant document. This is a quite good one with very specific examples. And then there's some e-learning modules that go along with those as well. So this is going to be the same whether you're talking about uh, support for nuclear power infrastructure development or many other uh, areas in the agency. The mechanisms for support include technical meetings. For nuclear power infrastructure, we hold two big ones each year. Um, the next one is coming sort of the last week of January. It's called the Topical Issues in Nuclear Power Infrastructure Development. Um, we organize as part of the integrated work plans a number of workshops, training courses, fellowships, usually using T uh, resources from technical cooperation projects. Um, we also organize expert missions and advisory services, generally to look at documents, policies, plans that you've developed and sort of want a set of expert eyes on. Uh, the review missions and peer reviews, I've mentioned several of them. There's the in-year IRS, EPREV, SEED, um, which are relevant for newcomers. And then there's a number of training tools and networks as well. Um, training tools, some of the key ones, uh, we offer training that we've done for several countries on modeling your human resource pipelines. Um, so we have a training tool for that. It's called the Nuclear Power Human Resources Tool. Um, another tool we have is called the Competency Framework. This is where you can look at different organizations in different phases, and it's pooled all the competences that are identified in IAEA safety standards in any series guidance documents for all the key organizations, so you know what uh, you should look for in those organizations in terms of your human resource strategy and in terms of the, the trainings that you should be going for in different phases. Um, and then there's this whole catalog of services um, sort of consolidated, there's a link to it there. So, conclusions for this talk. Um, you saw from the, the beginning of the presentation that um, despite things that have happened, the tail off in nuclear power, the failure of the nuclear renaissance to really materialize in full, there are a number of embarking countries that are moving ahead and we're gonna have countries operating their nuclear, first nuclear power plant for the first time in the coming years. Um, the IAEA milestones approach to introducing nuclear power helps guide countries through this process. And the key products that sort of help support this approach are guidance documents, training, review missions, and expert advice. This evaluation methodology, the document I circulated, the second one, provides a mechanism for evaluating the national nuclear infrastructure in different phases across all 19 issues. It's useful as a tool for self-assessment by the country. It can also be used as the basis for an independent peer review. And my section, the nuclear infrastructure development section, we try to coordinate all the efforts of the agency, and we're trying to uh, ensure that the agency support related to the introduction of nuclear power is relevant, timely, and of high quality. So here you can see that we have this infrastructure bibliography. This is useful because we have um, a couple of general documents, and then you can click on each of the 19 infrastructure issues and see the key IAEA guidance documents for each of those issues. Because in countries, it's, you, know, you may often find that you're assigned to work on three or four of these issues specifically, so it can help to, to identify what guidance documents are already out there. Um, the last thing I want to do is play this short video for you. And this is, I think, sort of a sum up of my whole first presentation. Oops. IAEA is here to help. We have developed the Milestones Approach, an internationally accepted method to implement sustainable nuclear power programs. Nearly every aspect of development requires access to modern energy sources. Many countries are now considering nuclear power as a sustainable energy option. A nuclear power program is a major undertaking requiring careful planning, preparation, and investment in time, institutions, finances and human resources. It involves 10 to 15 years of preparatory work and a commitment for around 100 years. The use of nuclear material requires strict attention to nuclear safety, security and safeguards. The IAEA Milestones approach 
enables a sound development process for a nuclear power program. It is a phased, comprehensive method. The completion of each phase is marked by a specific milestone. At each phase, 19 infrastructure issues need to be considered. Each issue is important and requires careful consideration and specific actions. Three key organisations are involved in building a nuclear power programme. The government should create a mechanism, for example, a Nuclear Energy Programme Implementing Organisation, or NEPIO, to coordinate the work of all organisations involved. A competent, independent regulator must be developed to ensure compliance with all nuclear safety standards. The owner-operator may be state-owned or private and must be competent to safely operate the nuclear power plant and meet regulatory requirements. In Phase 1, the country will analyse all issues necessary to introduce nuclear power. By Milestone 1, the country will be ready to make a knowledgeable decision whether to introduce nuclear power. In Phase 2, the necessary infrastructure covering all 19 issues is developed. By Milestone 2, the country is ready to invite bids or negotiate a contract for their first nuclear power plant. In Phase 3, the licensing and construction activities are undertaken. By Milestone 3, the country is ready to commission and operate its first plant. One of the most requested review services by newcomers is the INEA mission. IAEA and international experts review the status of a country's nuclear power development. However, it is the country's responsibility to put the resources in place and move the programme forward. It is the sovereign decision of every country whether to launch a nuclear power programme. The IAEA does not influence that decision. But when a country decides to go that route, the IAEA is here to help. The Milestones approach helps a country understand its commitments and obligations to ensure a safe, secure and sustainable nuclear power programme. The Milestones approach is documented in the IAEA Nuclear Energy Series publication, Milestones in the Development of a National Infrastructure for Nuclear Power. That's it. Uh, I also have an exercise planned, but before we do the exercise, do you have any questions for me? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wish I could say there was, but there's really no shortcuts to this process. And as I'll discuss in my next presentation, I think where you have nuclear power succeed is in countries where you succeed in building what we call a national position in favor of nuclear power, where you, if you have a two-party system where both parties support it for the same reasons, so that depending on who's in power, it's not used as a wedge issue by one party against the other. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd say they're right at about 10 years. I think they really got started in earnest in 2007. They were long on target to commission this year in 2017, probably 2018. So 11 years, I think, for UAE, probably. Yeah? Uh, which document specifically? Aha, uh -huh. yeah. So there was a meeting at the IAEA maybe this year, or la I think last year, and the, the question was from member states, um, you know, what's do if you go for an SMR, 
even some countries have asked, well, we want to go for a research reactor. How much of this is valid? Um, for an SMR, I think most of it's valid, or all of it's valid. And for a research reactor, almost everything's valid as well, except for the issue of electrical grid. Um, you would look instead at the end uses, the research and development program, what's the purpose of having the research reactor. I mean, most of the small modular reactors are basically just shrunk down light water reactors. Um, one thing that will probably be different maybe is that your emergency evacuation zone might be a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think it's shorter or longer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I have to say, if you're participating in the development of this document, you're more informed on it than I am. So. I think people. I think my section head is participating in this group. So, you know, I think whatever comes out, it will represent agency consensus. Yeah. Yeah. I think the agency can't solve these kinds of political issues for countries. But you know, the issue one of the 19 is this issue of national position. And we have a guidance document, which I'll present in the next session on this. And it's you know, the theme that comes over and over is that you have to get all the important stakeholders, and including if you have different political parties, it helps to get broad political support for the program. Otherwise, it's at a high risk of failing. It's true. And you may invest a lot in one administration, and if the other administration doesn't support and they come into power, then it all goes for nothing. So it becomes an idea that you the real scenario, you always be open to it. One way or the other. One party will agree, another party will disagree. So, just 15 years, we, or rather, you be a power, in my own point of view, now ends up like an ideal. It's an ideal. Uh, plan that would be a human nature future in the practical case. Yeah. And I think this is exactly what we would advise countries to do, is you need to consider whether it's going to work and be sustainable in your case. And countries may say, well, we would really like to have it. But honestly, we don't have the, political, the broad political support that's needed to make this commitment. And it's 10 to 15 years just to get the program off the ground and going. And then it's another commitment for 100 years to, to manage the operations and to deal with the decommissioning and, and the waste. Yeah. This is a really interesting area because we developed all this at the impetus of member states who were considering for the first time. Um, and it's been refined over years of experience. But then we found that a number of countries, and there are several, South Africa is one, Hungary is one, uh, I think Pakistan is one. Even the UK has come to our technical meetings and said, you know, we use some of the guidance in here because we've, UK hasn't done new builds since 1995. Now they're, they've signed a contract for a new plant. They need to 
you know, consider carefully stakeholder involvement. There are human resource pipelines, industrial involvement policy. So even some of these, and we call them now expanding countries, countries that have nuclear power, haven't had new build in a long time, and are now sort of looking and seeing, well, you know, do we have what it takes? They're using these documents. And South Africa even requested an in-ear mission in 2013 uh, to help look at the readiness of its institutions for new build. I mean, its regulator hadn't issued a construction license since before I was born, so. Yeah. Okay. I think it's a fantastic question. Um, when you ask around, people tend to have an opinion which I tend to disagree with. Um, the answer you hear a lot is, and you hear this, we hear it especially from other embarking countries that may be struggling a bit. They say, oh, well, the UAE, they have infinite resources. They throw cash. They hire all the consultants they need. They solve all the problems. I think UAE has really been helped by its ability to bring very good people into its organizations. But really what they do that I don't see in some of the other countries that are struggling a little bit is in 2007, they had a very, very strong national position. They had, you know, all the ministries, all the stakeholders bought into the plan. They released this white paper with their policy and strategy on nuclear power. It said, like, these are the six key principles for our program. Here's our plan to build the regulatory body. Here's how we're going to ensure safety. Here's how we're going to get international oversight. We're going to have the highest standards of safety, security, and nonproliferation. All these things. And everybody was always committed to that policy and that strategy the whole time. So they were very, very focused. And I think that's they were also very organized. Like I said, it's a lot of coordination. They didn't have, let's say, a nuclear group who was fighting against the Ministry of Energy who maybe didn't think it was such a good idea. It was a government-wide policy that everybody was on board and everybody was supporting. Do you have an example in mind? Like a physical risk, a security risk? Well, we went through a very robust process in 2013, 14, and 15 to revise the milestones document. And I think there's broad international consensus that if you cover those 19 issues, you're all set. Some of the issues that you're mentioning, I think, are covered in the issues of national position. This is the issue of political change. Funding and financing is a separate issue. And then security is another issue as well, physical protection. So I think if you follow the methodology and you can ensure all those things, you know, on the time frame that's set out, you should be successful. But it's possible that if you have those issues and you do a self-evaluation, you'll say, well, we don't meet the conditions here at phase one. And it's, you know, that's a, that's a warning or a red flag, I would say. One more question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. And I think um, the thing that indicates to me 
is that you'll help yourself going back later if you practice good knowledge management the first time around. And not to keep harping on the UAE as an example, but they're finishing their you know, 10 to 15 years here. And they're very focused right now on the issue of knowledge management because they're thinking that you know, it could be another 15 years or so that we want to do new build again. Do we want to have to go back from the, from the start and reinvent the wheel? Or can we sort of pick things up if we capture a lot of lessons learned, if we interview a lot of people and document a lot of things, um, maybe it can go faster. So I would say for countries that have considered and they've done some studies, maybe some have had site characterization done, you know, and now it's 20 years later, you have to go back and look and you know, you have to look at all 19 issues. Some of what was done before may still be usable. Some of it may have to be redone. And I would say the better records you keep and the more, if you practice good knowledge management, it can make it easier for you later. Okay. All right. We're scheduled for a break, but I think what I'd like to do instead is do a, an exercise and then we break after, if that's okay with everybody. Is everyone surviving and staying awake? All right. So you're going to need to get into your six groups. And it's one simple exercise, and then we'll go around. You all have the same exercise, and then we'll share the results, and we'll sort of judge each other's performance. So um, I don't know how, when you get into groups, are you organizing throughout the room? OK. Well, we, I can give you the thing first, and then you can get organized. And we'll probably give you 15 minutes so that we'll get back, and we'll share your results at 20 minutes past 3. So here's the exercise. Imagine your government has recently adopted a white paper describing your country's decision to introduce nuclear power. Your energy minister is about to give a press conference, and you are preparing for her media questions and answers. How would you suggest she respond to the following question in a few sentences? Imagine a reporter asks her, given that several developed countries have decided in recent years, Germany, Korea, plants are being closed in the United States, in recent years to phase out nuclear power, why is our government, why do they think it's a good idea to go ahead with a nuclear power program now? So get among yourselves, talk. You can invent whatever data and information you need, but be prepared you know, to give a pithy soundbite answer to this question if you're an energy minister. And then we'll judge if we're the public or if we're the reporter how skeptical we are or if we're persuaded. Okay.